And our next speaker also came from Europe, uh, Dr. Elke Anklum. She, uh, Elke is a chemist by training, and since 1991, she's been working at the European Commission's Joint Research Center. And she's going to talk to us about filling the knowledge gaps to manage the challenges related to microplastics in the environment and food. Thank you so much. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to be here, and I would like to thank the organizers that they informed me about the event and that I was invited to give a talk here. And um, so my talk is very general from the title. As you can see, lots of things have been said already. I would like to report back a bit on the outcome of uh, some events we have organized in the European Commission. But then I would also show what we are doing as actions in the Euro Commun European Commission itself. So let us just start on um, also mentioning the positive sides of plastics, because we all talk about the negative and, and the waste and stream, etc. But we all know plastics play an essential part in our life. And yesterday, when Anil took me from the airport, we discussed them in the car. I mean, imagine a car without plastic materials, for example. But also look at the toothbrush, and here we are. I mean, we are not using wooden uh, things anymore as maybe in the past. And we should maybe also consider it may not come our exposure from the toothpaste, but maybe also when we are brushing our teeth, what, who knows what's coming out from the toothbrush, but it's very practical. And but we, we should not forget that plastics really improve the quality of life. And think about the medical sector we cannot live without, I think, there. But, of course, what we need to look into, very important, is to look into the end of the life of these plastics. And we have seen these horrendous figures of production and, of course, also of the waste already. So we need a much better management of the end of life of, of the plastics. And, uh, of course, as we discussed it, we need to understand the impact on the environment, on the human health or well-being. And uh, again, yes, the positive or the potential negative impacts. And this is what it is all about when we come then to the tiny fractions which are out there. And we have heard about figures. I don't need to bother you with the EU figures, but there we all are starting to estimate and we are all horrified about the big amounts of plastics going into the oceans, plastic waste. Now, we have a new European Commission. You may have heard about that. We have a new European Commission president, and um, Mrs. Ursula von der Leyen has put out a Green Deal, because that's so important now. We discuss all the environmental issues in the moment, and she has put a lot of efforts. This is her highest priority. In her Green Deal description, in her political guidelines, she says clearly she wants to have zero pollution, whether this is possible, of course, very ambitious political goal, and the microplastics are mentioned specifically in there. So what is happening? We have already, before our new president came in, we have already worked out a European strategy for plastics. And for example, a very ambitious goal set by the European Commission by 2040, which is in 20 years, all plastics need to be recyclable. Whether with this we can achieve, I don't know, but it's always good to have ambitions. And, of course, you may have heard already of the European initiative banning single use of plastics, and I think this is slowly and slowly going out, especially cutleries and these plates, etc. You find hardly any more, you know, these products here, for example. This is, of course, these ambitious goals are challenges and, and for all of the stakeholders. And if you look into the producers, yes, they have really to engage now everybody inside and outside the plastic producing industry, and they have to come for more innovation for this goal and, and more innovation in the full life cycle of their products. Um, I already said that the 100% um, uh, reuse, uh, recyclability issue, really very challenging. And of course, if producing plastics, having those products, make sure that as much as possible is not leaking out during produ production processes, etc., into the environment. But there's a big challenge for the recyclers because they have to take the goal as well. And um, so it is, it is really important maybe to say this recycled issue, this has really a value, a market value. But the problem is this material, this recycled material, has to compete with virgin materials. And it's maybe much cheaper to start 
from scratch, do a new material, then to make the recycling. And making an upcycling and producing fuel out of it and then making the fuel cheaper than, you know, the other the natural fuel we, we, we are normally using is another issue. Then it's maybe because in the moment plastic waste is waste and it doesn't cost anything, but we should not forget that these whole products have already a value. And uh, yeah, the recycling, we, we heard about in the previous speech, multi-layers. It's not just one type of plastic, maybe easy, but I mean, what's going into the household bins when you do separation? Wow. I mean, looking sometimes into the box we have in our basement, there's everything in there. And how are you going to, to do that? Really, you have to separate uh, when you recycle. And OK, and we have also not much we heard about the additives. We do not have really an international agreed whatever amount of what should be the additives used etc., etc. So the amount of the chemical substances is high, as we already saw. And, which is said by the recyclers, the biodegradable plastics, which is now the consumer thinking it's the way out, is a challenge if you want to recycle. So there, and then it is mixed. These plastics are mixed again, and you, you are there. But it's also a big challenge for the regulatory science guys. And, I mean, we need to understand, and this is where we have many efforts. We do see what's going up and ending up in litter, but also to understand really the process of the degradation. And I saw the nice machine, a NIST, where you can look into weathering of, of your particles. I mean, this all we have to understand. And I have put microplastics and nanoplastics together and maybe call it NMPs, whatever. So we talk about those tiny fragments. Um, we have to understand the fate, exposure, and effect values for different of these materials. And... Um, we just heard this already. When we do toxicology, we need to have quality. I mean, these data have to be quality controlled. Um, by the way, I just brought a tea back from the breakfast this morning. We had, uh, <laughs> we, had, uh, we had already heard about the study where apparently you would find billions of particles then in your tea, and uh, my people don't actually are looking into this. It sounds a bit more positive, but nevertheless, we... We know they are out there. So the issue of microplastics, once more, I mean, we have said already different sizes, different si um, shapes, um, everything in there, very complex, very, very complex. When we can maybe distinguish between primary materials, which are purposely added to some consumer products, for example, for household cleaning products or in paintings and coatings, etc., and then we have the secondary materials where NIST is studying the weathering of, you know, maybe of these particles, etc. All those things coming up from our tires and from our clothes, for example. Maybe when we women put our stockings in the morning, we may be in a cloud of those particles. And we, if you look into the, the roads, I sometimes wonder where are the tires going in the end? I mean, the debris, yeah? it's going sideways of the roads into the environment. Here we are. So there are many, many sources, as we all know. My colleagues have made a little demonstration on this recently. So um, you can see it's industrial, urban, domestic. All of this can produce um, micro or nanoparticles, and then it goes into our human bodies or in the environment. In the food chain, it's not that straightforward that we have so much information. There are a couple, recently came out a couple of review articles looking into what's, what's up there, what do we have, and what methods do we have. And it's not so much, I have to say. A lot of effort is coming from the water. In the water, we know much, much more from the water chemists and water um, toxicologists, etc. And there are some other studies who have been looking into beers and honey and salt, etc. We should not forget, when we talk about fish, um, we do not normally eat the whole fish. There are some examples, of course, oysters or mussels. We eat the whole thing, the whole animal. Maybe another reason not to eat so much oysters, because they have also microbiological contamination. But um, we eat the flesh of the fish. So we have to understand, I mean, when we do really, if you want to understand what is really going into our food chain, we have to separate very clearly the stomach out of the material we are going then to analyze. We cannot just mill the whole fish or, or you know. Good. So there we are. It can come from everywhere. And just as an example, we also collected at the beach, and it looks very similar as what has been collected on this side of the ocean. So we, we have found lots of material. We separated it a bit. This is just some examples. And a very famous example in the European Union as a plastic debris is the Garfield phones. And I think they came from the US. This was, I don't know when it was done. I think it was um, it was produced in the 70s. People had this very fancy phone. I think when this phone was ringing, 
uh, the eyes were somewhere uh, doing something. So it must have been very funny. Anyway, um, we find debris, and we have this part in our laboratory. So one of our colleagues was able to, to get this somewhere. And um, so um, it seems that it comes from a ship who lost uh, these phones uh, um, uh, at, the, uh, at the French coast. And it continues to wash up. So, and this is not, I don't talk about micro, nano, I talk about big particles even. No? So, but this has been declared as a symbol of plastic pollution on beaches by some environmental organizations. So we have already discussed a bit, you know, what do we know? And, and to maybe the big question is, what are the effects in the end? So um, what is clear? We have, of course, it goes into the food chain that we know. It goes via the food, uh, via the water, certainly, into our, our food products. But what we really do not yet uh, really understand is, you know, what will happen if we ingest it? And what about the chemicals? Is it a Trojan effect of, you know, the microplastics bring another additives into our bodies, etc., what we discussed already. And there's so much to be understood on this. But one very important thing I would like to stress, and I think we need more discussion on this internationally, is really what we are talking about. And I think we had a um, global summit on regulatory uh, science uh, last year, and we had there are people discussing this as well, because, you know, we talk about the submicron and micron and uh, even the nano now, and so we need to understand what, what are we going to do. And there's a very nice paper out there, and I think if you get an international you know, understanding on this, and we say it goes from maybe one nano to, again, we have the discussions on nanomaterials, and it doesn't help us so much if you only talk about size in this respect, but maybe from one nano to five, micro, um, one, five milliliter, uh, millimeter is a big range. We should not forget. This is everything. And depending on your methodology, on your sieves you are using to filter them out, you will find that part or you will not find it. And I think there are so many challenges related to this. But we have to, we have to look into this. And then we have to understand water is very important. Water is also number one for food. And so we have really to understand how much is in there because we have to understand the exposure that the toxicologists can do their work afterwards. So in the tap water, this is something taken from um, Bart's studies. You can see Bart's paper here. Um, in tap water, we could maybe say some 10 uh, microparticles per liter and bottled water some 10 to 100 and groundwater would have less because it's maybe filtered out. But these are figures which are in the literature, but I think we need to monitor more, and we have to understand a bit more about this because we cannot just say in all drinking waters, in all tap waters, we have this amount. A wastewater, of course, has much more, that's clear, um, as we can understand. So what are the gaps here? And um, we already discussed a bit uh, before all the, the challenges we have in this respect. But I would like to focus now a bit much more on the very first part, on the analysis in the matrix. So think about water, for example. So, but what, what do we have? The sampling and the sample preparation is crucial in this whole. whole. And, and Bart has already said for the quality that uh, on the sampling, he is much more confident that we have already there some good quality control in the scientific literature. But we don't have really harmonized standards on this uh, available. And then the next thing is really, you know, we have to look into the methods which the people are using. And um, there's lots of variation. And there's lots of lack of harmonization or standardization. We have nothing standardized on this topic yet. But we want to compare the results, so we need something. The other issue, that is for microplastics, for nanoplastics, we have really not that much knowledge yet. And again, as we heard before, you use sieves of 43 micron or whatever, you will not see the nano uh, part there. And just to mention, we already struggle a lot with methods for nanomaterials. Normal nanomaterials, we have not really a validated method, although we don't work on this since 10, 15 years now. We don't have something really quality assured yet. So this is the challenge here. So what do we need? Uh, quality assurance, that's very important. In order to have data, we can compare, and we can compare our toxicological studies in the end. Um, so what, what we have to look into is what are the samples and what is representative. We have already understood from the one slide this morning, there are many materials out there. And what does it really mean? 
and what is the contamination, what are the additives in there, etc. And then what we need is validated, harmonized methods. And of course, very important, we would like to have a reference material. This is something where I can compare. For example, as Bart mentioned, we should have a positive control. I should also add a material, and that should be maybe characterized as well. So reference material. We are in the moment reflecting whether we need a global repository of samples from plastic. I don't even talk about nano or not even micro, but just plastic materials. Let's start something up there. Maybe this would help. And afterwards, as you can see in these little vials here, we, were, we have the technology in-house. Because we are the Joint Research Center is the in-house laboratory, like NIST a bit working lots of and standardization, we have the possibility to produce reference materials and make this milling. So we need ring trials afterwards. We have to validate those methodologies. And I talk only about the detection part, not yet on tox. So you see, we had a nice workshop, and you can read a bit more on the challenges and this, and you see Bart has been part of this, so I'm very happy that we are here together. So let me just say something what the JSC is doing. The Joint Research Center is the in-house laboratory of the European Commission, and we have lots of areas of research. And one of these is really, we have for now also because it's a very high focus of the European Commission, we embark on, um, on, on, on the issue on microplastics. So we have recently made a call for laboratories to participate in, an, in, in a proficiency test, not a validation of a method because we are not yet there, we think, but a proficiency test on it. And um, so we also start to build up the networks in the European Union, discuss these things, have information exchange, and I would also like to stress we have a facility we are opening up to researchers, specifically in the European Union, but also if somebody, some colleagues would like to use some of our instrumentation, just uh, send us an email, look at our website, you can participate. So we have lots of, of experience there. Now, if you want, and we, we, are, we were thinking, let's start with something, proficiency tests, we do something on water, and we want to take drinking water. So bottled mineral water, for example. Let's do a test material. We discussed with the water industry, and I said, what is your wish on this material? They said, at least 10 materials, if you can, and um, maximum 20 particles. If you want to make a homogeneous sample in this respect, a good night, I would say, bona not, because that's very, very challenging. So what we thought is we start very simple, and we start just with one material we, we discuss. We will take PET, we make a water sample where we know how much we are putting in the water, and we send it out. Now, what happens? So, now, oh, sorry, I'm already one too to, to quick, so we had several <laughs> workshops to discuss it. We discussed it, the standardization, and we focus on the water here now. And we do a study together with the German. Bum. So if you do so, you need to have a fit for purpose proficiency test material. And that means, it's in any case, homogeneous material. So this is our wish. Now, what happens? You take water and you add a bit of your nice milled microplastics of a certain size range. It's all on the surface. How can I send out such a sample to the participants, you know, and it's just there, and then you will have already house numbers and, and have oranges and apples when you look at the results. So we had already, this was a bit of a problem, I wanted to have as close as possible a real matrix. So we, have, we needed to add a bit of emulsifier into this, and it gets better, you can see on the right, it, it gets more um, um, to it. So what we then said is, how are we doing this? Still, we can't just send a bottle of water to the participants. So the idea was we are taking um, the PET materials, the PET particles, and we put them in a sodium chloride carrier. And sodium chloride for me is OK. My colleague started with uh, potassium bromide because it's used in FTIR and in IR. <laughs> but I said, no, do it on, on sodium chloride because it's at least in, in the food chain, and we have it naturally available. So we make um, a solution of that bring it into there, and then we, we put it in our freeze dryer. And then you get a sort of a sample, which is a sort of a cake. And then the participants would get a kit. And the kit would be this sodium chloride carrier with a number of particles in there, PET. But it is not just five. It is a bit more. Otherwise, we couldn't guarantee the homogeneity. And we give them a rinsing solution. We give them a water bottle with the water. Everybody should have the same water. And a protocol which is validated in-house how to do the reconstitution of the particles into the water. And then they can filter it out. And then we said, please measure everything you can see in there 
which is above 30. You see, we don't tell them measure everything. So we don't say also the nanopart. If people can do, if they want, they can. But we don't believe that people yet have all the methodologies. So we, we made a cutoff value of 30 and sent us either the number of the particles or the mass fractions in there. So this is what we are now doing. So we have now more than 130 laboratories worldwide who have an interest to study this now. And I think this is one of our biggest, largest number in proficiency tests. So people don't need to pay for that, but they need to follow the protocol. They get a very tedious um, questionnaire to fill in order to understand as much as possible for on the methods they are using in order maybe when we get the results back that we understand this is the method which shows better results than other methods. And then next step is we may go and uh, validate, etc. So if we start really at the, where is it? What is it? The chicken or the egg? What is first? You know, but we start um, very in the beginning. So once, once more to conclude, very complex, and uh, I don't need to say why. <laughs> I think you heard it this morning. We need the methods. We need them ideally validated. And then the monitoring results will understand the exposure that, of course, is, is, is very in, important. We need uh, um, harmonized methods. And once more, we need maybe more PTs, more proficiency tests. This is just one. I know that there are some other organizations organizing something, but we need more. Um, we also think about something in sediments, which is more easy matrix, but, uh, you know, and then maybe the next is fish or something which is more relevant for in the in human food chain. Um, then when we, out of our proficiency test, understand there is a good method, then we are going to validate it. And that must be done at international level. Then you will have, again, the problem of sending out a homogeneous sample. You send out the method protocol. And then you have exactly that protocol carried out in various laboratories. Very time consuming, very expensive. Not to forget, this is not something you do just in three weeks. And um, then maybe to go to other microplastics and mixtures and concentration and matrices. <laughs> you know, we have so much there. Maybe we can work the next thousand years on this. Um, and then whenever we think this is now a solid approach, we could then go and bring this methodology really to, to the standardization bodies. And, and I know that ASTM is working on something. ISO is very interesting to, to have methods, et cetera. And then, yes, we can go further on, on this. And it's very important that we network. And this is something we would really like to bring forward. Because I think there's so many efforts, so many things done. If everybody does the same as in the nanomaterials field, I think we have to align forces from the very beginning. And I think then the next part, and I think it will be discussed tomorrow, is what are we going to communicate? I mean, having a communication saying it's a billion of particles or out of your tea bags, it may be true. Maybe not that billion, but what is the message we are giving? I think that's another point. So I would like to thank my JSC colleagues who have been involved in all of this work uh, on the PT testing, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot. <laughs>